on Small Business Tuesday. This is Business Success. Welcome to Business Success, I'm Heidi Armstrong. Now on tonight's program we're talking about disruption in the financial sector. With the big banks bogged down by their legacy systems, we've really seen a rise in new tech-minded financial services companies. Ready to rock the boat, these fintechs can actually innovate at speed and provide the tools and services that many banks can actually only dream about. Well, tonight I'm joined by Aris Alagos, who is the co-founder of Moolah, a savvy fintech that provides unsecured online loans to small businesses. Now, Aris will be sharing the latest insights from the Disruption Index, breaking down the key issues and trends in the Australian fintech space. But a little bit more of that later. First, I'm joined by a very special guest who comes from us live in Canberra. White Roy, White Roy is the Assistant Minister of Innovation and if there's one thing that's always top of his agenda, it's helping Australian startups. So how can we better fund startups and what legal framework needs to change. Having recently visited Tel Aviv, which is one of the world's fastest growing startup scenes, White Roy explains what his vision for Australia is. Welcome to the program, White. Thanks for joining me. G'day, Hardy. Thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure. Now, it's a bit of a surprise, is it, that Tel Aviv is really this tech start, you know, a tech hub in the world? It is a little bit of a surprise, but um, mm. when you look at them, on every metric, they are really leading the charge on the number of startups per capita, the number of entrepreneurs, on the amount of uh, research and development done per capita, uh, the amount of venture capital invested per capita. They are streaks and streaks ahead uh, of the rest of the world. And in many ways, while we can't copy and emulate uh, Israel and we shouldn't try and copy and paste them, we need to develop a uniquely Australian innovation ecosystem, one that plays to our strengths. There's an enormous amount that we can learn from them and uh, I think also there's a lot of similarities in many ways. Uh, we both have pretty strong anti-authoritarian cultures. Uh, we both sort of like the underdog in many ways. Uh, in that sense, uh, in Israel they call it a bit of chutzpah um, and here I think it's that, that underdog status. Uh, and I think um, also Israel is a small population and essentially an island. Um, you know, their, their neighbours are uh, what people would call probably commercially difficult. Uh, so they're kind of an island and we are obviously an island as well. So I think there's an enormous amount that we can learn from them from the policy space. Who did you meet over there that really stood out and has sort of helped paved your thinking? Well, I was really lucky. I met um, some incredible entrepreneurs, uh, some fantastic scientists and researchers at some of the most amazing universities. Uh, but somebody who really stood out to me is Israel's chief scientist uh, and we, we shouldn't really think of him as a scientist, he's not, he's a very very successful entrepreneur uh, but he's essentially in charge of uh, running Israel's commercialization programs and promoting, uh, promoting an entrepreneurial culture uh, in Israel. He administers about half a billion dollars of funding each year uh, and the way that he approaches this, uh, the way that he approaches it from the government's perspective uh, is that it's the government's job to create a framework for the ecosystem, it's the government's job to help drive collaboration between all those elements in the ecosystem, so researchers and scientists and uh, business people, entrepreneurs, uh, so that they can commercialise uh, that research. And whenever he's using taxpayers' money, uh, it's always done in partnership with the private sector. So if you look at Israel on a per capita basis, the highest rates of research and development uh, investment, but when it comes to the government's perspective, that's actually one of the lowest rates in the world because wherever he's investing money, uh, it's invested with the private sector in partnership, which is kind of a pretty innovative way of thinking, and I think it's one that we can look at uh, here in Australia. How hard is it going to be to take these ideas and bring them back and implement them here in Australia, given, you know, we're not really apples for apples? We're not, and as I said, I don't think we should copy and paste, but uh, I am deeply optimistic about this. Uh, there is a strong imperative for us, and uh, you know, the Prime Minister calls this the most exciting time uh, in human history and the most exciting time to be an Australian, and I agree with him. Uh, we live in this age of technology disruption. Globalisation is shrinking our globe, uh, but uh, we have enormous strengths to play to in this country. We have some of the best talent in the world, some of the best and brightest people in the world. We have a lifestyle that is attracting the best and brightest from across the globe because if you're a great entrepreneur, uh, you can pick any country in the world to live in. This is a very good country to live in and to start a business. Uh, and I think particularly, this is the big thing, uh, so much of, in uh, of innovation is about how you can grow and scale a business and how you can disrupt on a very large scale. 
Uh, and a big part of that is about market access. And I think in the past, uh, we've thought of ourselves as a marketplace of 23 million people, which is nice. And, you know, there's a great sort of testing environment there. But in reality, we're, we're a global marketplace. And we have access, particularly into the Asian marketplace, where you have a billion people coming into the middle class uh, that no other country on earth has. Uh, I think that will really drive innovation in our country. And if we play to those uniquely Australian strengths, uh, then we can learn a lot from the rest of the world, but develop something that is hugely exciting here. And I'm very confident we can be a global leader uh, in innovation if we overcome a few policy roadblocks along the way. Do we have to overcome the mental roadblock as well? I know in the past when, there, when we've spoken on radio, you've talked a little bit about the mindset of that it's okay to fail. And you've sort of recently talked about making some changes to bankruptcy laws. Is that the thinking to sort of encourage that it's okay to have a go and fail? Absolutely. I, I think this is, um, uh, this is the hardest thing for us and it's probably one of the more important things to overcome. And this has to come from government, from the media, from the private sector. But essentially, uh, we need to be more prepared to take a risk. Uh, that's a good thing, to take on risk. Uh, and we need to be prepared to fail and say that if we fail, uh, in many ways, that's a learning experience for us. Uh, and if you look at Israel and our country, this is where you, you see the, the divergence. So in Israel, uh, funded uh, startup companies, funded innovative companies, uh, are usually uh, funded by somebody that's had a go four times. In our country, uh, the funded companies, it's usually their first. And I think that that shows that we, we do really have to have a new cultural uh, approach to risk and failure in this country. And there's some policy levers that we can pull, uh, some things around tax and incentivising investment into innovation in this country. Uh, you mentioned bankruptcy laws. I think that's something that absolutely we can uh, change in this country as well. Um, to really help drive that cultural mindset, um, which doesn't necessarily change our culture, but plays to those best elements, that aspirational mindset, that entrepreneurial spirit, and that anti-authoritarian entrepreneurial sort of underdog status. Changing bankruptcy laws is a little bit of a challenge, isn't it? Because there's obviously that balance between making sure that we're appropriate and we're providing lots of safe, safety checks for people who are trading with each other. How do you find that balance and what do you think that, that those new laws might look like? Uh, well, I think you're absolutely right. We do need to find a, a balance. Uh, there does need to be a little bit of mystery in the world. I can't give you everything uh, tonight, but oh, uh, we'll be on. making some statements pretty <laughs> shortly. But. But, but I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a little bit of thinking on this. Uh, you know, when we think about our tax system, again, we don't say that we should be the lowest taxing nation on earth or the highest taxing nation on earth, but we do say that we should be globally competitive in our tax system. And I think when it comes to uh, bankruptcy laws and solvency laws, uh, again, we have to have that same almost philosophical approach that we don't want to go too far in this. You're absolutely right. Uh, but we need to be globally competitive in that space so that our, our laws are comparable to our competitors in the United States, the United Kingdom, New Zealand uh, and our Asian competitors uh, in, the, in this region as well. So that, that's sort of our policy framework. Absolutely, we don't want to go too far, but we do need to make it easier that if you, if you have failed, uh, that doesn't write you off forever. You can learn from that experience and go on and, and create uh, new and exciting businesses and hope, hopefully uh, employment opportunities for Australians. Where do you think the difference is between being a startup and being a small business? I'm very passionate about small business myself. And, you know, we hear a lot about the government supporting innovation and supporting this startup tech space world. But what about small business? Because that's the heart of the Australian economy, ultimately. You're absolutely right. And innovation is so much broader than uh, simply tech or startups. Obviously, that's a very important part. We find huge employment there. Uh, but of course, small business is the backbone of our economy. And uh, innovation is also about em embracing new practices in the small and medium enterprises. Uh, I think if they're more innovative, if you get a little bit more pro productivity in small and medium enterprises, uh, that will create enormous economic prosperity and, and new job opportunities. Uh, but the distinction that I make is this. A small business, by definition, is small. A startup, it might be small at some point, but its ultimate aspiration is to be a very disruptive company on a very large scale. So to disrupt the traditional industry or a competitor, uh, to be globally scalable, uh, and ultimately a startup, while it might be small to begin with, its, its aspiration is to be, you know, probably a multi-billion dollar company uh, where small business, family Even small businesses aspire to be big though, Wyatt, don't they? 
Well, well, some do, some don't. I mean, I would argue that uh, perhaps the local corner shop, uh, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, I love them all. Uh, they are the backbone of our economy. But that is different to someone who's <laughs> saying, uh, I want to radically disrupt the accommodation industry. I want to radically disrupt the transport industry. I want to uh, change business practices on an enormous scale. And um, that's kind of the distinction. But it, it should never be one versus the other. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like that ad where the, where the girl's selling the tacos. Why not both? Uh, we should have a vibrant <laughs> innovative small business sector and a, and a vibrant and uh, innovative startup sector in this country. Uh, something that, uh, well, an industry that's very close to my heart is financial services. And I'm chatting um, a little bit later in the program with Moolah, which is a fintech for providing unsecured business loans to small and medium enterprises. Where do you see that the, the financial services space is most ripe for disruption? I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that you're having that conversation with them. And there are some really exciting things happening in the fintech space in this country. Uh, recently, I've been out visiting Stone and Chalk, which is a fintech incubator in Sydney, uh, doing exciting things. Uh, in my mind, I mean, you should talk to an entrepreneur about where they see the opportunity, not a politician. Uh, but, but I think you can see this um, throughout the entire financial services sector. People see us as a safe, secure environment to do this. Uh, technology is changing the way that people interact with the financial services and fintech space. Uh, and there's a number of um, really exciting things happening there. Again, from my perspective, it's not for me to sort of pick the winner out of that. It's just to say that uh, in a strength that we have in this country, which is financial services, we've done very well. If they embrace innovation, if they innovate internally, again, that will drive that economic productivity, those new job opportunities that we want to see. And I would argue in the same way that we should see that in that traditional strength. I'd also like to see that in our mining industry, in our agriculture sector, um, as I said, innovation is about changing that business model or, or, or creating greater productivity, uh, a greater entrepreneurial output in all of these sectors, and fintech is a pretty exciting part of that. Look, it's been absolutely fabulous to have you on the program, and thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Hardy. Looking forward to chatting soon. Sounds good. Coming up after the break, we glean the latest insight from the disruption index that was released today. So watch out, there's a new standard in lending for small business.